him as, as the supreme ruler, which, which he obviously is. You can see him as, as the creator of the universe, as our heavenly father, as, as God Almighty, as, as the Lord of hosts that, that um, controls the, the, the armies of heaven, the one that, that commanded the angels to come down and destroy cities like Sodom and Gomorrah. You, you can see him as a wrathful God, as a vengeful God. You can see him as a loving God. There, there's a lot of different images throughout the Word that describe our God. But I think of all of them. But this is one of my favorite images of God right here, the way that Jeremiah uses to describe him. He, he calls him the potter, and he, he, he compares us to the clay. Amen. Sir. How, how true that is, that, that you and I are, are the clay in, in the potter's hand. And, and, and He wants us to yield to Him. He, he wants us to, to surrender to Him so that He can make us in, into the, the beautiful vessel that, that He wants us to be. You notice here, as, as Jeremiah was watching the potter work with the clay, he noticed that it was marred. Which I looked up the word marred in a dictionary, and it decayed, ruined, corrupt, spoiled, disfigured, Wasted. That last word, wasted. Just, just no good for nothing. Useless. Yes. That, that, that's the way when Jeremiah looked at the clay, that's what he saw, but that it was ruined, that it, that it was ready to be thrown on the trash pile. Now, that wasn't the potter's fault. No. Just like the Creator God, it's not His fault that, that His creation sinned. It's not His fault that, that we fell off track. It's not His fault that that we have been born into sin, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's not God the Creator's fault that we are marred, that, that we are run in a lot of ways. Um, just like it wasn't the, the potter's fault that the clay was marred. But think about it. When, when you think about us as being marred, and when you think about the clay as being marred, what would most of you do if you was a potter? Just think about it and be honest. What would you do if, if you was the potter and you saw that your clay was marred, you was trying to work with it, you was trying to form it, you was trying to fashion it, and, and nothing was working. It just wasn't working. It was just a rough, wasted piece. Most of us, I know me, myself, I would, and most of you, if you was honest, you'd say you'd just pick this clay up, you'd just throw it away, throw it on the trash pile, and you'd go get a new lump of clay, and you'd start again. But that's not what the potter done here. You, you look here in, where was it, around verse number 4. It says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he didn't throw it away. What did he do? So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. But when I think of myself as the clay, I don't know how, how all of you feel, but when I think of myself as the clay, I like those words, he made it again. Amen. I'm thankful that he made it. Again. Yes, sir. You know, it would have been easy for God to have took me and, and all my mistakes and all my weaknesses and all my sins, the, the drugs, the alcohol, the, the bad attitude, all the things that I've done wrong throughout life. It would have been easy for God to have took me, wadded me up, and threw me in the trash pile. But that's not what He does. He made me again. And to all of you that's here that, that is bought by the blood of Jesus, to all of you that are here that are saved, that have given it all to Christ, He made you again. It would have been easy for Him to have just throwed you away and left you in the state of sin that you was, but He didn't do that. He rested down, He picked you up, and He made you again. I'm thankful for that. You know, we can, we can look through the, the Bible and we can see a lot of great men that, that what we consider great men, great characters of the Bible, that God made again. A lot of the, the, the ones that we think of as the heroes of our faith Amen. did not start out great. They, they was not perfect all through life. We, we think of Abraham. We can use him as an illustration. You know, when, when we think of Abraham, most of us think of this great man of great faith. And Abraham did have great faith, and he demonstrated it. That's why the Bible says that he was a friend of God because of his faith. But you can also look at Abraham's story and you can see time and time again where Abraham messed up, where Abraham made mistakes. You, you can see when he went down to, to Egypt, when the famine was in the land and he went down to Egypt to, to gather food. 
He went in, and, and the Bible says that Sarah, his wife, was a beautiful woman. So he was afraid for his life that when he got there, that they would kill him so that they could take his wife. So he lied. He, he disobeyed God. He broke God's rules, and he lied and said that she's not my wife. She's my sister, and had her play along with it. That great man of faith doubted God's ability. You can look at when he, when he uh, was promised a son in his old age. He, he doubted, and Sarah doubted, and that's why they sent him in to lie with Hagar, who, who bore Ishmael for him. Again, a product of sin, a product of disobedience, a product of lack of faith. It would have been real easy for God to have took Abraham and said, No. You have disobeyed me time and time again. You have doubted me time and time again. No, I'm going to throw you away. I'm going to raise up a new man Amen. in which I'm going to establish my nation, in, in which I'm going to bless all the earth, in which I'm going to increase the seed. All the great promises that God made to Abraham that he would, that he would do, it would have been easy for God to just start it over with, with, with a new lump of clay, so to speak, but he didn't do that. He took Abraham and he made him again. Amen. And the Bible says that Abraham became a friend of Amen. God. What an honor. What a privilege if you think about it. To be called a friend of God. I can't think of anybody anywhere that I would rather be called a friend of than God Almighty. He was a friend of God not because of how great Abraham was but because God did not throw him away. He made him again. <clears throat> we, could, we could look at one of my favorite new character testaments. Peter, you've heard me talk a lot about Peter. You know that, that he, he's one of my favorite characters in the New Testament because of his confidence that he had in the Lord. When we think of Peter, we think of a bold, courageous, confident, almost so confident in, in the Lord and in the ability of his God that it's almost on the verge of cockiness, the, the way I picture Peter. That's the way we picture him when we think of the end result of Peter. But if you remember some of the mistakes that Peter made, remember he told the Lord, he promised the Lord, I will go with you all the way. Being his, his cocky self, I will go all the way to death with you if need be. But we also know that very same night that he promised you, that the very same night, he didn't even make it to the next death in keeping his promise. That very same night, he denied the Lord not once, not twice, but three times. He denied Jesus just as Jesus told him he would. Jesus told him up front, now you will deny me this very night. Three times before the cock crows twice. And Peter did. It would have been real easy for God to say, now I told you. I told you you was going to fail me. I told you you was going to fall. I told you you was going to let me down and you was going to abandon me. Now I'm done with you. I'm going to build up a new man to build my church when I'm going to build up a new man to, to lead this church, to lead my church into the future. But that, that's not what he done. We, we know what happened was that Peter, he wept bitterly. He ran out. He repented. Amen. And at that very moment, God made him again. And we know some of the great and wonderful things that Peter ended up being a part of. We know that he was there on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 men was added to the kingdom. 3,000 souls were saved Amen. that day, all because God did not throw him away. I'm thankful that God does not throw us away. He don't just throw the clay away. And, and I, I, we could use many of them. We could go all through the Bible, just about every great man we could look and we could study and find his fault. But one more illustration that I want to use, a man after God's own heart, when you picture a man after God's own heart, that's the way they worded King David, that he was a man after God's own heart. If we didn't know anything else about David, if we didn't know his story, if we didn't get to read the Psalms that he wrote, if we didn't know anything else about it, that description would, would, would paint a picture and give us an image of we would think, wow, he was a great man, a man after God's own heart. He, he was righteous. He was pure. He was holy. He had to be. He was a man after God's own heart. We know that in just, just a chapter or two is all the story is told of where David committed a sin in which he broke at least four of the Ten Commandments in just a short chapter or two. Talking about when he, when he came out on the rooftop 
and, and looked down into his neighbor's yard and, and saw his neighbor's wife, Bathsheba, as she was bathing and wanted her. He coveted, right there, broke command, one of the commandments, he coveted his neighbor's wife. We know that, that he thought, well, I'm the king of Israel. I'm the king of the greatest nation on earth, which Israel was at that time. So I can have anything I want. So he sent for Bathsheba. He committed adultery with her. Broke the second rule right there. A man after God's own heart. Broke the second rule right there, the second commandment. Know that he didn't want to man up afterwards. He didn't want to, you know, if you mess up, fess up like you hear me say a lot. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to fess up. So, so he tried to sweep it under the rug and he lied about it. He lied to Uriah. He, he in a way, even lied to himself because he just kind of tried to picture or pretend like it didn't even happen. Just tried to sweep it away and make it go away. But we know that Bathsheba was pregnant. So she came to David. And then what did David do? He, he had lied, so he had broken three commandments already. He sent Uriah out on the front line of battle where he had him go out on the front line and he had all the other troops draw back off of him. His friend, Uriah was his friend. Uriah was one of his most